item of business today is a member's business debate on motion number 9759 in the name of Sarah Boyack on the first anniversary of the Rana Plaza disaster. This debate will be concluded without any questions being put and I invite those members who wish to speak in the debate to please press the request to speak buttons now or as soon as possible. Ms Boyack, if you are ready, seven minutes please or thereby. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. And can I first of all thank colleagues for their support in enabling me to table this motion for debate in the Parliament tonight, and also to comment that there are constituents who were very interested in the fact that we would be debating this issue tonight. I think it's important that we raise awareness of what needs to be done to tackle the conditions that led to 1,129 Bangladeshi garment workers who lost their lives and 2,500 who were injured in the Rana Plaza building collapse. And 24th of April was the first anniversary of this tragic disaster in which an eight-storey building collapsed in Savar near Dhaka in Bangladesh. And I want to use my speech tonight to highlight what happened, why we should be concerned, what happened after the disaster, and what are the wider lessons that need to be learned and action which still needs to be taken. The building which collapsed wasn't fit for purpose, it wasn't built to house the weight of machinery that was in it, and there had already been a warning about safety which went unheeded. The workers were paid a pittance for their work, and that is the case in many, many factories in Bangladesh where garments are produced. So we should be concerned, because some of those garments find their way into the chains that are experienced in Scotland and the rest of the UK. And I want to highlight the fact that there were two key initiatives uh, that happened in Bangladesh after that incident. Firstly was the accord which was signed by uh, the Bangladesh government, the key industries, the trade unions and NGOs. And in the, international, in the immediate aftermath of the event, it was estimated that 90% of Bangladesh buildings don't meet their local building codes, never mind international building standards. And in a country which is prone to earthquakes, that's something which is a major challenge for the Bangladeshi government and local government to address. But the Bangladesh Accord on Safety in relation to fire and building has been a big step forward. And Oxfam record that there will now be over 1,500 factories which will be inspected in Bangladesh. And I think we have to regard that as key progress. On the other major initiative that brought together the government, the industry, trade unions and NGOs, there is much more that needs to be done. And the Rana Plaza Agreement, while strongly welcomed by people, um, has led to a challenge because although some companies have made donations and some people have been able to be compensated for their loss, for the health implications where they need support afterwards and for people whose capacity to work has now been removed, although some people have been compensated, there simply is nowhere near enough in the funds to enable the second set of compensation agreements to be made and to be debated and to be handed out to thousands of people whose lives have been ruined by that experience and the distress that has come from the experience. So there has been some uh, organisations and some donors that include well-known names such as The Gap, Asda and Debenhams, um, and some of the companies have paid into the fund were not connected to the Raza Plana disaster. But campaigns have sprung up to highlight the lack of contribution for some of the biggest retail companies whose names would be known to all of us. Only 40% of the target set has been reached. And there are many well-known companies still not just to make contributions, but to make significant contributions. Now, it's been suggested that although no Scottish company sourced clothes from the Rana Plaza, Alison Johnson, who's not here tonight, proposed a motion welcoming the fact that the Edinburgh Woolen Mill, um, which did source clothes from the Tazreen factory where 100 people died in another incident, um, they have suggest, uh, Alison Johnson and Seed have suggested that there is still more that needs to be done in terms of establishing accountability and contributions for that factory incident. And Seed also want responsibility chains to be established for companies involved in sourcing garments for the Commonwealth Games, and they would particularly like the Minister to respond to that issue. So I believe there are issues about compensation, there's issues about building safety, there's also issues about asking questions about the pay and the terms and conditions that Bangladeshi workers experience. 
when they are producing garments that we want to import to developed nations. Now, in the future, the day on which the Rana Plaza disaster took place will be commemorated by the Fashion Revolution Day. And that campaign aims to, aims to highlight the rights of garment workers so that we have an annual focus and we never forget the experience of the loss of life. It's been reported that Bangladeshi workers are some of the lowest paid in the world, with workers taking home 62% less than the living wage. Nearly 40% 40, 40 of the garment factories in Dhaka fail to pay the minimum wage. And the International Labour Organisation and Oxfam highlight that problem. And they challenge us to ask questions about the clothing that we buy. The issue was addressed in a motion by Kez Dugdale recently. So there has been interest across the chamber on making sure that we highlight these issues. But I think it's an act of international solidarity. It's an act of social justice. And I think it's something that we as individuals, as MSPs, can promote. But we can also work with organisations and NGOs in our communities. The Clean Clothes campaign was set up to particularly highlight known brands who've not made any or sufficient contributions to date. And those new campaigns, the Fashion Revolution Day and the Clean Clothes campaign, will sit alongside the work of established organisations such as Seed and Oxfam, who have long worked to lobby for justice for workers and to, act, to lobby for action by major companies to take responsibility for tackling poverty pay. No worker's life should be put at risk due to a lack of an appropriate safety measure. And the first year anniversary is a day that we need to commemorate in the future. We need to acknowledge that those who died, died in tragic circumstances. And we need to use those deaths to serve as a reminder of the importance of health and safety at work, abroad and at home, and to campaign for the rigorous protection of workers' rights for all. In the Workers' Memorial Day that I know that many of us celebrated this year, there was a campaign for workers across the world to agree that we would stand in solidarity to remember the dead, fight for the living, and ensure that lessons are learned, that tragedies are not repeated in the future. So there are issues that we need to be taking up in our own communities. There's a challenge to make sure that Scottish consumers and companies operating in Scotland support stronger accountability from companies who source clothes from factories across the world for sale here. There is a chain of responsibility. We need to highlight that chain of responsibility and encourage our constituents and organisations and companies that are active in Scotland to look at that chain of responsibility in terms of their own procurement policies and in terms of their sourcing policies. Today in the Scottish Parliament, we can add our voices for justice for garment workers so that they receive fair pay and decent and safe working conditions. It's an act of solidarity with some of the lowest paid workers who experience working conditions that would simply not be acceptable here and in the rest of the developed world. So let's use our political influence to support them. Thank you for having the opportunity to raise this motion. I hope in his closing remarks that the Minister will be able to think of issues where the Scottish Government can help highlight those campaigns and to look at issues where the Scottish Government can help that train of accountability and support corporate social responsibility for our Scottish companies. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Thank you. Now call on John Mason to be followed by Patricia Ferguson. Four minutes or thereby, please, Mr Mason. Uh, thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. And first of all, I want to thank uh, Sarah Boack for bringing forward this uh, debate. I think it's one of these subjects which we wish we were not having to speak about, but which we most certainly do have a duty to speak about in this Parliament. There's clearly quite a lot of ground covered in the motion, and uh, Ms Boyack has covered quite a lot in her speech, and I'm very happy to associate myself, I think, with all of that. Clearly, the focus of the motion and the debate today is in Bangladesh and the particular Rana Plaza disaster, uh, and I'm more than happy that we support the call for contributions to the compensation fund. However, the next main theme is to uh, reduce the risk of such disasters happening again. In their briefing, Amnesty International emphasised human rights, and the relationship there is between government and business in Bangladesh, which does seem to be unhealthily close in some instances. In Oxfam's briefing, they talk about our responsibilities as consumers to be responsible for the clothes we buy. And Sarah Boyack mentioned that eh, as well. And at the very least to question, why is something so cheap? Now, of course, I myself and probably all of us here like to get a good bargain, but there has to be a reason why a shirt or a pair of jeans are incredibly cheap. 
And that reason may be that the wages are far too low or there are virtually no health and safety standards in wherever it was produced. And I think this brings us on to the whole topic of fair trade. And we have made real progress on food and drink. From years ago, the tea was pretty poor, the coffee was pretty poor, and we've moved on to, to good quality products, tea and coffee, other uh, fair trade products like chocolate, sugar, wine, uh, which many of us buy. And I know that uh, myself and, and many others, when we go out to buy these kind of food products, we do regularly choose fair trade products, because at least we have some assurance that the workers have a decent wage and there will be some kind of health and safety standards in there. But it seems to me we have not made the same progress with clothing products, and that concerns me. Perhaps it is more difficult to change that kind of to uh, product from the grassroots, because clearly tea and coffee can be sold at a small stall, a school fair or a church, uh, and that is not possible with a range of clothing. But somehow we do have to address and tackle this situation. One suggestion I would just make, uh, and I know which has had success in the past, is through pension funds. Uh, local authority pension funds, amongst others, have huge investments uh, in a range of companies around the world. And I know uh, when I was a councillor, I served on the Committee for Strathclyde Pension Fund. And one of the things we felt we could do was to be ask the fund managers to bring reports to us on corporate social responsibility and whether companies, big companies like BP and Shell and others, were they paying proper local wages, were the, the conditions uh, locally uh, healthy and good. And I mean, that at least was some kind of pressure on some of these companies that they knew they had to report back uh, on these things. And to be fair, corporate social responsibility has moved forward. I think, too, we have to be clear that it's not just uh, rich nations, rich Western nations trying to impose their standards on the developing world. This is about having decent wages and health and safety all over the world, because we get it wrong, too, quite frankly. Uh, on 28th April uh, this year, I was at Glasgow Green uh, sorry, uh, commemorating Workers' Memorial Day, which uh, Sarah Boyack also mentioned. And from memory, I think Patricia Ferguson was there, and I think Drew Smith uh, was also that, there that day. And Patricia Ferguson was talking about her proposed bill, and there was also a real focus on the Stockline tragedy, uh, which happened on our very doorstep in Glasgow. So I hope we can put the emphasis on working with countries like Bangladesh and not talking down to them, as I fear that Western countries have sometimes done in the past. I mean, finally, if we're going to be idealistic, I would like to move uh, towards things like a worldwide minimum wage, albeit at appropriate local levels. I was trying to remember the singer who mentioned that in one of his songs. I think it was somebody called Ian Davidson, but I'm not uh, entirely sure on that. Uh, and I accept that some of that may be a long way off, but at least we need to talk about these things. We need to keep our focus on this. Uh, we should not just think about those who are struggling in Scotland, much as we should in the UK and Europe but really on people who are struggling all around the world eh, because each person is of equal value. Thank you. Thank you. I now call on Patricia Ferguson to be followed by Cameron McGannon. Four minutes, so thereby, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. May I offer my congratulations to my colleague Sarah Boyack for securing this debate about one of the world's worst industrial accidents. And can I uh, offer my apologies to yourself and to the Chamber, Presiding Officer, as I will have to leave when I've concluded my speech. As we've heard, over 1,100 people lost their lives and a further 2,500 were injured when the Rana Plaza complex collapsed on the 24th of April 2013. Having witnessed the effect on my local communities of an industrial disaster where nine people lost their lives, I can only begin to imagine the effect such a devastating event had on the Savar district of Dhaka, where the plaza was located. And we know that many of the survivors are still struggling with injuries that affect their ability to work and that many families have lost their breadwinner and are experiencing brutal hardship to this day, which is why the Rana Plaza Agreement uh, and the compensation process attached to it is so important. But as we've heard from Sarah Boyack, it is woefully inadequate. But of course, what happened at Rana Plaza was not the first large-scale disaster in the ready-made garment industry in Bangladesh. Months earlier, in November 2012, 112 people were killed in a fire at Tazreen Fashions. Between 2006 and 2009, 414 garment workers were killed in 213 separate factory fires. And in the five months following the fire at Tazreen Fashions, a further 28 factory fires were reported, with eight workers killed and at least 591 injured. 
So what is it about the garment industry in Bangladesh that makes it so vulnerable to tragedies of this kind? Well, I think firstly it's worth noting that this industry is a key driving force of the Bangladesh economy and that it's highly politicised. In 2011-12, Bangladesh was the second largest exporter of apparel in the world and the industry accounted for 13% of the country's GDP and provided employment for an estimated 3.6 million people. And although Bangladesh has improved its economic outlook significantly in recent years, issues such as workers' rights, transparency and building regulations have not kept pace. And within the garment industry, buyers demand low prices that are achieved by rival companies constantly undercutting one another, paying low wages and having scant regard for the health and safety of their workers. And when you consider that Bangladesh has the lowest hourly wage rate in the world, and that many garment workers work long hours without extra pay just to meet targets, you begin to get a feel for a sector and an industry where workers have little value. Now, Rana Plaza exemplifies this disregard for safety, as on the 23rd of April, the day before the collapse, cracks appeared in its walls. It was reported in the media that the country's industrial police had recommended that the factory owner suspend production until the situation could be investigated by independent inspectors. Indeed, the bank and shops on the ground floor were still closed when the collapse took place. But the upper floors, where the garment factories were located, were, in the factory, were, were opened rather, as a result of the factory owner having an inspection organised by his own contractor who declared it safe. Probably not uh, much surprise there. And it's alleged that some of the workers were threatened with dismissal if they did not return to work, and that many of them returned to their machines just an hour before the building collapsed. So what can and should be done to improve safety and conditions in Bangladesh? It's clear that a complex set of relationships are at play in Bangladesh. And I have to say I was very impressed by the report produced by the Bangladesh All-Party Parliamentary Group at Westminster. They have produced a raft of recommendations based on conversations they've had both here and in Bangladesh, and many of them seem to me to be eminently sensible. Now, I'll single out just a few of those, and I'll also paraphrase them for speed. But they suggest that Western governments should use their influence to encourage Bangladesh to address labour rights, minimum wage levels and enforcement that the Bangladesh government should establish a disaster relief and fire emergency plan with adequate funding and ministerial responsibility, and that there should be support for the minimum wage board, which has been established in Bangladesh. They also suggest that there has to be greater worker participation and representation in the running of companies, and that a system of building controls with appropriate training and record keeping should also be established. One of their other um, ideas that I thought was very interesting was that there should be a kite mark for ethically produced garments. Now, given the hundreds of items you can now buy that are fair trade marked, and given that many of those are made with cotton and other fabric producing item, uh, materials, I wonder whether you need a separate kite mark for ethically traded garments and ethically produced garments, but I think it is something that's worth looking at, presiding officer. But it seems to me, presiding officer, that we must also consider whether the West's insatiable appetite for low-cost garments also plays a part in this story, and I believe that it does. Now, in previous debates about the Stockline tragedy, which John Mason mentioned earlier, I've often suggested that no one should die just because they go to work. Well, in my view, that applies just as much in Bangladesh as it does in Scotland. Thanks very much. Now I call on Cameron Buchanan, after which moves the closing speech from the Minister. Mr Buchanan, four minutes or thereby, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Like many members, I well remember the pictures from the immediate aftermath of the collapse of the factory at Rana Plaza. The aspect which sticks most in my man, mind was the look of sheer confusion and the general chaos which seemed to characterise the immediate response. Obviously, the scale of the tragedy quickly became apparent, and shortly after, the broader issues with the garment industry came to light. However, since then, Rana Plaza slipped from the front pages, and that is why I'm very pleased that, this, that, uh, that we've got this debate this evening. 
Indeed, whilst the discussions on the safety of the factories and the conditions within them have continued and the role of the garment industry, the attention this issue has re received has been a good deal less than would perhaps expect from a tragedy on this scale had it been anywhere and in other country. I would like to congratulate Sarah Boyack and indeed the many other people who are determined not to let this Rana Plaza disaster fade into history and are determined to ensure that whatever else, the lives of the thousand or so workers which were lost were not lost in vain. And in this instance, we cannot stress the importance of all our individual responsibilities in terms of this issue. Of course, the UK government should and has taken action on this matter, which is most welcome. The provision of the 1.8 million funding towards the Trade and Global Value Chains Initiative is one such development which should strengthen the relationship between buyers and factory workers. This coming on top of the Responsible Accountable Garment Sector Challenge Fund, which works with some of our top retailers in order to improve conditions for workers in the industry. But of course there's another link in the chain, and that is ourselves as consumers. With garment marketing rules relaxed, thanks mainly to the EU regulations, where it is no longer compulsory, which due to the lobbying of the Spanish, who were keen that both Mango and Zara did not, not want to disclose where their garments were manufacture, manufactured. It's been nigh and impossible to say if the clothing is made in a foreign sweatshop or not. So I think this kite mark idea is a very sound one. If, as someone who's worked in the textile industry for a long, long number of years, I always take a keen interest in whether garments I buy are manufactured. I have to say that I find many people make assumptions also about high prices being a marker for quality, which is not the case. Put frankly, we cannot make such assumptions, and really, if we're to put pressure on retailers and drive up working, workers' conditions, we must start better informing ourselves over the origin of our clothing. And I don't just mean country of origin, as in all countries there are factories that are safe to work in and provide safe and reliable employment. And we shouldn't really use sight of that. In relation to that, I'm pleased to see that the UK aid is providing money towards factory inspections in Bangladesh, which I understand will number 2,000 next year. But of course we can always do more. And the problem is also because we pay, we, we do these factory inspections and then we put money into the fund, but it's the bosses that keep half the money and still pay the workers the minimum wage, and it's very difficult to control that. As consumers, we should be asking questions as to who it is that is producing our clothes, what conditions they're working under, and whether the retailer is doing all it can to support better standards. Indeed, I hope that this increased publicity over the efforts of some of the companies involved with the compensation of workers will shame them into becoming more generous and proactive. The fact that so many companies who had goods manufactured at Rana Plaza failed even to attend the first meeting on compensation is really shameful. And that's a mild word for it. These companies must do more, and we must keep up the pressure on them to do so. And that goes beyond the issue of compensation, which at least seems to be moving forward with the Rana Plaza arrangement. But to the broader issue of welfare and conditions for workers, particularly in the developing world, we need to be confident that the cost of our clothes is at the expense of the consumer and not the welfare of those making them. Thank you. Thank you. We now move to the closing speech from the Minister, Hamza Yousaf. Minister, seven minutes or thereby, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, my thanks to Sarah Boyack for bringing this motion forward. She has a long uh, history and notable uh, history in this chamber of bringing forward uh, issues of importance uh, across the world. And uh, I commend her for uh, doing that once again with this uh, motion for all the other members who have signed it and indeed spoken on it uh, today. Um, as we all know and has been mentioned, 24th of April 2014 marked that first anniversary of the tragic Rana Plaza disaster, uh, which uh, at least claimed the lives of 1,129 1, uh, garment factory workers, potentially even more than that, uh, and left many more injured. And as Patricia Ferguson was saying, uh, that disaster came only a few months after the Tazreen Fashions Fire in Dhaka, which killed 112 workers. These tragedies, uh, and like many, many others like them, are a stark reminder of the human cost of our demand for cheap, fast clothing and of the horrendous working conditions of those who produce them. I think John Mason was correct to say, in some element, in some respect, probably all of us at one time or another have been guilty of being part of the problem as indirectly uh, perhaps without the knowledge that we had of the consequences of those actions because we wanted a demand for cheap uh, and fast clothing. I think it's important we do recognise though the garment sector in Bangladesh is a complex issue. It's not as, it's not as simple as perhaps uh, was being or has been portrayed uh, previously. The industry is worth over £13 billion, providing jobs for more than 4 million Bangladeshis, the vast majority of whom 
uh, are women. Uh, on one hand, the industry is absolutely vital to poverty reduction and to the economic empowerment uh, of people, and in particular of women in Bangladesh. It gives women opportunities to work outside the home, to earn their own money, to help support their families. It also offers an alternative to early marriage. However, uh, there is, of course, the flip side of that, which many members uh, have mentioned. If those conditions are exploitative, uh, there is no excuse for the appalling working conditions which led to the tragic Rana Plaza factory collapse. It's imperative that those who were affected by the disaster, the child who lost his mother, the woman who has been left disabled, uh, all of these people who are now unable to support their family, it's vital that they are properly compensated. And uh, Sarah Boyack uh, asked uh, what the Scottish Government can do in that regard. Uh, we urge uh, companies, of course, uh, to, to stick by the agreements uh, that have signed, which I'll go into in more detail. But certainly I can commit to uh, raising this issue with uh, both the Honorary Consul uh, of Bangladesh and certainly when I next meet the Ambassador uh, of Bangladesh to raise this very issue, I may be happy to do that and take this, take the uh, collective voice of the Parliament in that matter. Uh, one year on, and uh, many members here have mentioned some of the progress that has been made in terms of improving building safety conditions, uh, but also, very, uh, very importantly, inspections, uh, but also the work that's been done to urge buyers to take responsibility for their supply chain. Uh, I welcome the uh, introduction of the Rana Plaza Agreement of Compensation, which will support the victims. However, it is vital, as I say, that the, compens that the, that the compensation scheme adequately compensates all of those who were affected. I would reiterate the calls of every single member of this chamber for companies operating, uh, indeed in, the motion says, uh, companies operating across the Lothians region, Scotland and the UK, especially those companies that sold clothing uh, that was produced at Rana Plaza to make sufficient uh, and appropriate contributions to ensure that that £24 million target uh, is reached. Uh, the Sarah Black will understand that as a government minister and as a government we don't have uh, legislative uh, power to force them to do that, but certainly I think the Parliament should send a strong message to those UK companies and those Scottish companies to ensure that they're living up to their uh, important responsibilities. Uh, I think we obviously all of us agree that it's completely unacceptable to face a threat to your life when you go to work. Patricia Ferguson made that very poignant reminder as to John Mason about um, <clears throat> the Stockline factory. So whether it's in Scotland or Bangladesh, everybody should have the right uh, to work in safety and to be expecting to go back home after a hard day's work. Uh, as consumers, we all, of course, have a responsibility to think a little bit harder about what we're buying. Uh, there's no such thing sometimes as a, as a, as a good uh, bargain. As a government, we have a responsibility to be a good uh, global citizen. Our achievement of fair trade nation status last year, in particular, I think, uh, gives us uh, more leverage, uh, leverage to do more uh, on this issue. Uh, the Scottish Government, for example, and its recent uh, passing of the public procurement uh, bill, of course, included an amendment that came from the government uh, in terms of guidelines uh, for public contracts regarding ethical and fair trade policy. I think that is a step in the right direction from where we have influence on public contracts to ensure that uh, those who are exploiting workers uh, will be made to, to answer for that in the procurement of public uh, contracts. On top of our fair trade nation status, which I think we can do more on and uh, more with as a government in this particular uh, in this particular issue, uh, we are very proud of the work that we do uh, in Bangladesh through our international development uh, priorities. Uh, we have uh, uh, currently funding four projects, uh, which are just uh, shy of a million pounds over three years between 2013 and 2016. And uh, they work on food security uh, and also working with marginalised communities and mitigating the effects uh, of climate change. In terms of what more the Scottish Government can do, uh, many of us will know the UN guiding principles on business and human rights which was endorsed by the UN Human Rights Council in 2011. The UK launched its implementation plan in September 2013. The Scottish Government has been liaising closely with the Foreign and Commonwealth Office in that process. We have in Scotland a National Action Plan on Human Rights, which was facilitated and drafted by the Scottish Human Rights Commission, excuse me, and launched on the 10th of December 2013. It contains within that a commitment to develop a coordinated plan of action in Scotland to give effect 
to those UN guiding principles, also, also known as the, the, the Ruggie uh, principles, um, which are uh, many members across the chamber will know about the Ruggie principles. They're there to provide respect um, uh, for, for human rights in the context of business activities. Uh, and uh, states, uh, those that are, uh, of course, uh, in the United Nations, have a positive duty to take all necessary steps to prevent business-related human rights violations. And we, as a, a Scottish government, in the context that we're in, but even if Scotland votes for independence, will uh, be an advocate, of course, uh, of those principles. Uh, so, in uh, conclusion, presiding officer, I'd like to note, as others have done, that 28th of April 2014 marked uh, Workers' Memorial Day. The purpose of that day is to remember all of those killed uh, through work, but at the same time ensure that such tragedies are not repeated. I completely share the sentiment, believe uh, that the work on Scotland's National Action Plan on Human Rights has an essential role to play in improving business practices, but we need collective action from the globe and for the, for the community of nations to pull together. And I think the Ruggie principles are certainly one way of doing that. So I thank once again uh, Sarah Boyack for keeping this issue in the, in the spotlight. And I'm sure that uh, the message will be loud and clear from this parliament that we must never, ever see another tragedy like that of Rana Plaza. Thank you. <clears throat> Many thanks. I now close this meeting of Parliament.